amazing webinar called The Five Keys to Leading an Engaging Guest Interview. As a quick reminder, I am author of Always a Lesson blog, podcast, educational resources, and now consulting services. My podcast is called the Empowering Educators Podcast, and that every five episodes I interview someone that is a leader in the educational field. And the feedback I have gotten from those I have interviewed and the listeners themselves has said, hey, you're actually really good at this interviewing stuff. You should help other people. And I thought, ding, 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 not only do I love helping teachers, but I think that this would actually be great for two types of people today. Educational leaders who are interviewing potential staff members, but also those in the podcasting world who are conducting interviews to help share the knowledge with all of their listeners. In addition to those things, I have a decade of interviewing experiences, ranging from hiring a new teacher all the way up to a principal. And I am releasing my newest baby, the New Teacher Academy. This is an online module for those learning to become a teacher. It helps them land the job before, during, and after the interview. So let's dive in to exactly what we're going to learn today. I have two objectives for you. I want to help you conduct guest interviews that are effective, engaging, and empowering. Because those three things are very different, and you're going to learn throughout this webinar today how some of the interviews you have already done fit maybe one, two, or maybe all three of these descriptors. But we want to make sure that every interview hits all three. And then I'm going to allow you to practice keys to effective guest interviewing so that you can formulate some strong habits. But before we dive in, I need you to imagine your ideal guest. You're going to need this visual so that throughout our practice today, you have someone that you can see sitting in front of you that you are potentially going to interview, and this will help you script some questions and practice some of the tips and tricks that I'm giving you today. So to do that, I'm taking the phrase big hairy goal and turning it into a big hairy guest. So what does that mean? That is a heavy hitter in your field of expertise, someone you are a fan of. They are popular in your sphere of relevance, but it has to be someone you haven't interviewed before because otherwise you're going to already throw out some of the things you've done, and I really want to make sure we are starting fresh today. If you have an actual picture of a guest, that would be awesome to actually have it out on the desk next to you while you're going through this webinar today. Here's what you're going to need something to write with and something to write on, whether it's paper and pencil or a tech device, because we are in the 21st century and I am fine with that. So as you're getting together those materials, I will wait for just a second. And I am going to preview for you today that there are going to be times where you are going to pause the webinar and you are going to practice what I have just shared with you. So I'll let you know when that time comes, but that's exactly when you would use your supplies. So just wait until I ask you to pause. And of course, if you just want to sit through and, and do the practice at the very end, that is up to you as well. So let's start with the biggest tip of all. I think that the key to life is found in connections. A lot of my happiness, a lot of my joy, a lot of my fulfillment comes from connecting with other people. But there's different types of connections. Some connections were short-lived, but others have turned into relationships. That's kind of step two of the connection. Well, step three of the connection is to make sure it's a give and a take connection. That way I form the strongest relationship. So in terms of interviewing, you want to make sure you're not just firing off questions, having no emotion, and not engaging with that other person, even if it's for a job interview. You want to make sure you do have a relationship formed. You never know where a connection can lead. So be your best self always. I want you to think for a second. How can this tip help you conduct an interview with a guest that are those three descriptors we talked about? Effective, engaging, and empowering. So let's start. I'm going to go backwards. If you have your graphic organizer, because when you signed up for the webinar, you got that free resource. You can start filling in your notes now. 
Key number five is personality and imperfections. Some people say you shouldn't show any personality, but to be honest, I've been on the side of hiring someone for a job and the ones that were themselves and showed their human side and laughed a little and weren't trying to be perfect with their word choice, those were the ones we ended up hiring because we felt that connection. And the same is true when you're doing a podcast interview. Keeping in some of the ums or uh or let me think for a minute, anything that you would probably edit out can make a connection with an audience member. It makes them feel, oh, this is a real person. I can see myself sitting in a coffee shop talking to them. So sharing your personality and imperfections is certainly encouraged. And this hits the lever of being engaging. So let's talk through some examples and non-examples. You can laugh. I know that a lot of podcasting is going on virtually, but when you're talking and smiling, we can hear it. We can hear that change in your voice. Definitely smile if you're in person in the interview. But I say be quirky. So if you have an accent, don't try and hide it. Or if you have a cultural phrase, use it. I know down south we say, bless her heart. And if that's what you say, then say it because that makes you who you are. I think there's something about being professional and being polished, but it's okay to have a little edge to you, a little personality, a little imperfection. That can go a long way to making that connection and that relationship. All right, a non-example. I call it the Johnny Bravo radio voice. Hello today out there in Wonderland. And you're thinking to yourself, who talks like that? And if you did talk to me while we're sitting in a coffee shop, I would laugh at you. No one wants to have an interview like that. And I can't even imagine showing up to a job interview and the person interviewing me had that voice. It would totally crack me up. So let's save that for a radio or a TV um, job that requires us to be that way. But in terms of these interviews, let's just be ourselves. How about a formal tone? Well, yes, there are times when that's okay, but if you never let your hair down or you never just try and allow yourself to connect, sometimes being formal, you have a wall up and you're just thinking about how to say something the most perfect way. You've practiced your answers. You're half listening to what's being asked of you. You're not even really making that eye contact. It just takes away from the connection to build into that relationship. And ultimately, your listeners or the person on the other side of the table interviewing you really feels that distance connect. And your word choice. If you're if you don't speak with formal word choice, then why do it now? I'm not saying bring out all your slang. I mean be purposeful with what you choose, but you want you don't want to sound like a robot. You want to showcase who you truly are. All right, so this is now time for you to pause the webinar and I want you to practice showing your personality and your imperfection. So look at that picture or visualize that big hairy guest in front of you and just have a casual conversation where you are the interviewer and you are asking them questions, but you are smiling while you're talking. You may throw in a laugh at part of the question. How about that accent or that cultural phrase? Go ahead and be you. Alrighty, well, thanks for tuning back in. I hope you found that practice helpful. We are on key number four, making our way down to number one. Grab that graphic organizer and fill in the next key, making connections. And I do say when it's appropriate. So this hits being engaging, but also this is where you can really empower the person you're having a conversation with or anyone that's listening. Here's some examples. When you are interviewing someone, you want to be able to have a shared experience. So if they bring something up and you're like, oh, that's happened in my life too, you don't want to forget about it, move to the next question. That's a perfect opportunity to connect with them. And then your audience is like on the inside of this relationship and this bond that's forming. So you could say, 
you bring up a really good point here. I have experienced that same thing when dot, dot, dot. Now, be brief here because it's not about you. But if you take just 10 to 15 seconds to affirm their response, oh, gosh, that's happened to me all the time. Now they're smiling. They're engaged. They are not feeling formal. They're at ease. They feel like, oh, this person is like me. This is sitting down at, at a coffee shop with my friend. Again, short and sweet. A non-example is just to say, yeah, me too. And then it goes nowhere. You want to follow it up with, that's happened to me twice before, or that just happened to me on Tuesday. Boom, next question, please. But on the other side of that, you don't want to go on a lengthy tangent that the spotlight is on you and you're now talking for two minutes and the guest is like, why did you even bring me on? Sounds like you're interviewing yourself. So that's what I meant when it's appropriate. If there's something that the guest says and you can agree or say you have felt that way or, or been to that specific place or have a thought about it, chime in, but keep it brief. All right, so you know what time it is. It's practice time. So visualize that big hairy guest. Start the dialogue. Start your interviewing questions. Think about key number five. And now let's add in key number four to our practice, making those connections. And I'll see you back here when you're ready. Just pause the video. All righty, welcome back. Heading on our graphic organizer down one more to key number three. This is called personalize the experience. This is going to hit engaging and effective on our key lovers. So here are some examples of personalizing the experience. Your questions and your comments need to be reflective of your research on the guest. So there's no reason to have questions that the guest is going to say, I don't know the answer, or they're going to look at you like, uh, was I supposed to prepare for that? I'm not really sure what you're talking about, because you're trying to highlight this person. You want to use their expertise to help your guests or your audience listening. So you want to make sure your questions and then any of your commentary is related to them. That's how you personalize it because each guest experience should be different because each guest is different. So a little phrase you could say is, I know that you blank. And that shows them that you have done your research on them. You found out something about their background, and this is leading in to one of your questions. This makes them feel included. And then something simple, just use their name throughout your questions or throughout your comments. Please don't do it every time. So John, blank, blank, blank. So John, blank, blank, blank. That gets repetitive, and then it's almost impersonal because it's like you're forcing it. But, oh, John, that just happened to me last Tuesday. And you go on in another question. So John, I wanted to ask you, so just find a place to put their name into the dialogue. Some non-examples. As I was mentioning, unrelated to the expertise of the guest. So what do you think about landslides in California? Um, I'm not sure. I'm a singer and I'm here to promote my new album. You know, that just doesn't go. Or you would say something that was non-inclusive like, well, what we do here is, and now it's like they have to be part of your party instead of that you're allowing them to be them you welcome them with open arms they can be who they are this is another platform for them to meet new people not be part of my club so it's that time folks it's practice time i want you to think about key five key four and now personalize the experience so make sure the questions are related to the guest by using some of those phrases that show that you research them and then throwing in their name every now and again. Go ahead and practice and I'll see you back in a minute. Alrighty, welcome back. Moving our way down to key number two. Grab that graphic organizer, fill in the next key called listen and respond. Now this is where I got most of my feedback from, that this is where I excel and I didn't realize why I did. I think it does have to do with my experience of interviewing potential teachers and principals, but it really came from being a teacher and having to listen to your kids because you sometimes think you're being clear, 
and then the kid just doesn't get it and so you have to do your best to uncover why they're not getting it and my listening skills got very good over that decade of my experience and I think pairing that with interviewing allows me to really be present and hone in on what someone is saying because I'm using that information to judge where I'm gonna go next so this hits all three, and I wanted this to be key number one because it hits all three, but there's something more foundational that has to be key number one or this whole thing's going to fall apart. But after that foundational thing, this is going to make or break you, so please pay attention to what I have to say here. Let's look at our examples. Something that I have said as I'm listening to a guest who's answering one of my planned questions it makes me think of another question. And although I am ready with my next question, I really have something that could go nicely with what they just said. So I'll say something like, you know, I hadn't planned on asking you this, but since you bring it up, blah, 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 blah. And so now they're feeling, oh, she's listening to me. She's not just going down her checklist. Because one thing I do is I send the questions ahead of time to my guests so they know the flow of the interview. And that's exactly why I want to say I hadn't planned on asking you this. So they're not like, wait, where was this question? I didn't prepare. But it also lets them know she's paying attention to what I'm saying and she wants to have a conversation with me versus just talk at me with these pre-planned questions just like you would at that coffee shop with your big hairy guest or I might say something like I like how you said blank it makes me think blank now I'm hitting the key where we talked about those connections that's a great time to plug one in when you're listening to what someone says and you are responding or just have a transition phrase so it can tie their response to your next question and this is where I started because I wasn't really ready for the other two examples and I thought okay I know what my next question is so start listening because as soon as they wrap up their answer you have to think on the fly of how that can connect to your next question and that's going to be helpful for you when we get to key number one to learn a little bit more how to do that but if you can't think of a comment or a new question and you're just ready to move to your next sequence, totally fine. But you want some sort of transition besides the word, so my next question is, right, you want it to sound like a conversation, not question, answer, question, answer. So some non-examples. Skipping to the next question. So. It's now time to practice, and I know this is going to be a little bit more difficult because you are not sitting in front of your big hairy guest, and you're not really sure what they're saying. So I'm going to allow you this one chance only to flip the script on yourself and answer the questions you've been asking for key three, four, and five. Just pretend you are the guest, and you can play both roles and allow yourself to respond and then either add in a new question or have that tie together sentence, but just really be present and listen to what they're saying because this is what guests remember. Oh my gosh, I love that interview. I didn't even feel like it was an interview. I felt like we were just sitting and talking. You were listening to what I was saying and commenting and, and sharing your thoughts and connections. And then your audience feels like they are literally just sitting in, listening in next to you at the coffee shop. And that is where the money is when you're having an interview, especially those who are interviewing for a job, making sure you're really listening to what's being said, even though you have your own plan of action. So I'll see you back here in a few minutes. All righty, you guys ready for key number one? Let's do it. Here's the foundation. It's all about the questions. So if you don't have any, you can't even try and do key two through five. Develop questions ahead of time. That seems like a no-brainer, but I feel like I have to say it, so I'm going to say it. You need to have a roadmap so that if the interview is really quick, you're over prepared, or if you feel like you're running out of questions, you're not in that panic mode of I have to think on my feet. So I always like to develop about 10 questions and we may get through seven or eight of them, especially if I'm doing a Twitter chat where I'm moderating and the conversation's just going really well and I don't want to just push everyone along. I want it to be natural. So just over prepare. 
with those questions, they need to be aligned to your mission, but also to the guest experience. And this is hitting being effective and engaging. So we've talked a little bit before about making sure your questions are related to the guest's experience. Otherwise, they're going to have nothing to say on the topic. What do you think about that shark bite in Florida? It's like, I, I don't know. I never heard about it. I am on the show to talk about business ethics. And you're like, ah, that's not a good match. But it also needs to be aligned to your mission because if you're a podcaster, you're your audience is not going to want to listen to someone talking about something that's not interesting to them. So because my podcast is for educators, I interview educators because I know my audience is full of them and they want to hear from somebody else. There are times where there could be a unique job that would be related. So I'm not saying it has to be the exact same job title, but it does have to be of interest to your guest. If you're interviewing for a job, you want to make sure all your questions are related to that job and you're not really highlighting the guest, but you do have their resume. So it's a good time to pull some things off and see how the two align. You want to make sure this is a mutually beneficial relationship. Questions need to allow for the interviewee to expand on your question, share a story or explain their perspective. So now we're hitting being engaging and empowering. So you don't want a yes or a no question because then your interview kind of dies and you're running through lots of questions in a short amount of time. You want to have almost like a broad or vague question that the guest can go any which way where there's really not a right answer. I just want to hear you talk for a little bit. So share that story or your idea, or your perspective. So look at your questions and say, is this something that could require like a 30 second answer or is it more like a four or five, maybe just a head nod? making sure your questions uh, can be expanded on. And then please internalize your questions because what's going to happen is you might see an opportunity where you can swap the order based on the flow of the conversation. So it might be appropriate to ask question eight after question two if the guest brings it up. And so if you haven't really internalized your questions, you're going to think, oh, well, I'll just keep going down my list and when I get to number eight, now I have to say, well, we talked about this before, but I'm going to bring it up again now. So now this is disjointed. It sounds like this wasn't planned well. There's not a good flow. And this happens a lot in job interviews where they ask something and it's like, I just answered that five minutes ago, but I'll repeat myself again. So you want to make sure you really know what you're asking and that way you're not reading it off the paper. It comes off the lips. You're like, you find one key word in the question and you know exactly what you're going to ask next. That just helps calm everyone down makes it feel natural like it's just a conversation. This is really about being effective here. So let's look at some examples and non-examples. Prepared ahead of time, I mentioned being cool, calm, and collected. If there are aligned questions, this shows you that your show, or if this is just a normal interview for a job, that there's a focus. And it's building on the expertise of the guests, but it's also interesting to your audience. If it's an expansive answer question, you should say things like how or why versus what. What tends to have a short one to two words or phrases of an answer. And so asking how or why helps expand that answer. And internalizing questions, like I was mentioning, you can move the order of the questions around based on the flow of the interview, and this is very natural. Well, a non-example, you're not prepared ahead of time, so this may delay your show as you're trying to think of what to say, a lot of dead air time, or the questions just are now unrelated because you're literally like, oh, do you like pizza? And it's like, I'm just trying to think of something to say to get you to talk again because I'm out of questions, I'm not prepared, and then they're not even building on each other, so it's literally just a random list of questions. You, When you're a podcast host, you want everything to build up to that really last question. So you start with surface stuff and you kind of add a question that builds on that until it's just like boom at the end of the uh, episode and it's like some amazing tip or trick or aha moment. And that can be true of an interview. You want to start short and sweet. Everyone's getting their feet wet. It helps the guests calm down because it's like, oh, I know my name. <laughs> I know where I lived. Like the answers are, are something that's familiar and then you're going to dive deeper into something that requires a little more critical thinking where they could get a little nervous. 
questions that are not aligned. So it might be an interesting question, but the guests can't answer it. And I mentioned that before. That's like the worst. Or the answer that they share is just not interesting to your audience. So if you're interviewing someone about flying a plane and no one in your audience is listening to your show about that, that's probably not a good question you want to ask. And that happens sometimes where guests have a lot of other interests. And it's okay to say, what do you do in your free time? And then they mention flying the plane, but that's not the focus of the interview. And you're not going to come up with a question about that unless somehow you're able to bring it back home to the aligned focus. Brief answer questions, avoid one word answer questions. I've mentioned that before. And reading a script. I have been on so many interviews for my podcast and my brand, Always a Lesson. And it's so in, so formal and just impersonal when someone's just, and now I'm going to ask you, and then you hear the page turn, if you want to, and it's like, oh my God, this is horrible. Like, when is it going to be over? You really just want to have a conversation. Hey, how's things going? Blah, 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 on and on and on. And it's like 30 minutes later and you're like, I feel like we just sat down and started talking. I loved it. This was so fun. Versus that was the worst eight minutes of my life. Like, I'll never come back to this interviewer. So you want to make sure that you really are internalizing everything so it's not inauthentic or boring because if you're boring the guest you're probably boring the audience and that's not good for anybody now it's the time I want you to practice you might want to spend the longest amount of time with this key here so you might pause the video for a while you may script a few questions and then you might practice keys two three four and five with the questions you've developed with key one so I'll see you back when you're ready Alrighty, I hope you found that practice to be really successful. Let's build some muscle memory. I don't want you to forget each key. Look at that graphic organizer, key five, as a review, personality, and imperfections. 100% okay to share those things. Key four, make those connections when it's appropriate. Key three, personalize the experience for the guest and the audience. Key two, listen to the guest and what they say and then respond in kind. And the foundation, key number one, it is all about the questions. And the teacher me can't help it, but this is way too hard to remember. I know this makes sense because key five is not the most important and key one is, but I needed an acronym so I could remember what each of the keys were if someone were to ask me. So I came up with plimp. <laughs> Not the best word, but anyways, it's the only way I could rearrange these so I could remember what they are. And you can, of course, flip back the, the P's. But which one of these here are you struggling with? And which one is an asset? So for me, I was told the listening and responding was my strength. I think um, something I could work on is key number three, just personalizing the experience, making sure it's all about them and it's in the little things. Like obviously I'm having you here because I'm interested in you, but really pouring into everything about them so they feel very special that day. So again, not that I'm not doing a good job, but I think that that's an area I can spend some more time on. So how about you? Go ahead and just take a second to reflect. You can pause the webinar and, and maybe prioritize these. Where where are your strengths? Maybe you're going to reorder them from your best to your worst or your worst to your best. But I'll see you back here in a second. Well, thanks for coming back. Here is your plimp of keys for effective interviewing. I want to go over objectives one more time to make sure we've got it. I want to help you conduct interviews that are effective, engaging, and empowering. And how do we do that? I gave you the big tip that it's all about those connections turning into relationships. And then I gave you five keys. Remember PLIMP? Five keys to be effective, to be engaging, but then be empowering. And that's when you are sharing your story and connecting so naturally with the guest that they are bringing out things they didn't even realize they were going to talk about today. And this ends up helping a listener do something better in their own life or maybe even inspires you as you're listening. And I know that's happened to me every time I, I went in with one idea of how the interview was going to go and I left thinking, whoa, like that was one amazing guest. I can't believe blank, blank, blank. And that's the empowering part. But you can't get there if you're really not effective and obviously engaging.
The second objective we hit today was practicing those keys to effective interviewing so you formulate some strong habits. Those are my examples and non-examples. So I suggest you go back through, jot down on your graphic organizers the examples, and then every time you're interviewing, try and add another key. So maybe you start with your strength, and the next interview you add in another key, and another key, and the more that you add on until you have those five, and until those five are present every interview. That's how you build your muscle memory, making short turns into a habit. And it's not going to happen overnight or after one interview. But the more that you are conscious of it and you have it in front of you on your graphic organizer, the better off you are going to be. Of course, teacher me is going to sign homework. I know you probably hate me. I've rephrased it, though. I'm calling it next steps. Here's what I'd like you to do. Internalize those keys. Plimp. I want you to implement the keys consistently with each interview. So it's a recipe. You're not allowed to just pick and choose what you want to do because it's really these five together make the most impactful interview. You want to make sure that you're building up to be able to do all of them together. Take some time to reflect. Prioritize what you need to work on. What are you doing well? We don't need to practice that right now. We want to focus on an area where we are weaker. And that starts with being honest with yourself and a reflection. Note those areas of strength and growth. And then the most important part is that you don't just stop when you reflect and say, yep, I'm good at this and I'm bad at this. Moving on. No, we actually have to say, what is next? What am I going to do about that? I need to problem solve. So I need to start planning my next steps. And then, when you're really feeling good, ask for some feedback from your guests. And they may not say anything more than that. Yeah, that was a good interview. But if people are giving you unsolicited feedback, like what I had gotten, I never asked anyone how I did. They just, whoa, that was so fun and I really liked it. And I thought, well, I did too, obviously, but it's awesome that you think that too. And then they went a step further and told me specific things that I did or said that made it enjoyable. And I started thinking, if someone's going to go out of their way to compliment you, you must be doing a great job. And so that's why I put this together for you. I know some of it felt a little obvious, but sometimes someone just needs to tell us what the obvious things are, right? For it to sink in and to have it on the tip of our mind going into the next interview. I have a bonus for you. For attending the webinar, you are going to get this free gift of these PowerPoint slides. And I know that may not sound as exciting, but if you're type A like me, I was probably trying to write everything down and I don't want to miss anything or my graphic organizer is so messy for me planning all those practice rounds. So all you got to do to get a fresh copy is text one word. It's called EEE. -E -E. Remember, those are our three E words. EEE -E -E interview to the number 33444. It's going to ask you for your email address, type it in, and then boop, it's sent to your email address. You have all these slides. Um, I, what I especially was thinking about for you guys is you can print out the one that has all the keys on it and just hang it in your office somewhere. And that's just a good reminder every time that you're about to sit down for an interview, have it fresh in your mind of the things you want to do when you're preparing and ready to get into that interview. Before I let you go, I do want to give you an option to connect with me. Shoot me an email. Let me know what you thought of the webinar or any additional help you may need. I am willing to sit with you for an hour or so and, and mock interview and allow you to practice your keys. So just shoot me an email, Gretchen at alwaysalesson.com. My website, if you want to reach me there, alwaysalesson.com. Podcast is the Empowering Educators Podcast. I would love for you to subscribe and then rate and review once you've heard the shows. That really helps me reach out and help more people. If you're a social media junkie like me, I can be found on Facebook at Always a Lesson, Twitter at G. Schultek, my maiden name, LinkedIn, Gretchen Schultek Bridgers. Well, that's a wrap, folks. Hope you enjoyed the webinar on effective interviewing and those special five keys that I released as a secret to you today. Hope you enjoyed your free resource.